I'm going to talk to you today about crafting a contemporary Indian aesthetic. I was concerned yesterday that we were sending out a message that there are only two ways to aesthetic and design pedagogy, Western or Indian, and that allied to this, Western was modern, India was traditional. And further, that everyone had to make a choice which direction of these two to choose. That is not at all the truth. What we all want is that students and teachers today make informed use of the multiple, many faceted perspectives and choices that India offers and create our own contemporary creative solutions rather than mindlessly borrowing contemporary, uh, contemporary solutions developed for other societies and situations. It is these multiple choices we were talking about yesterday, that I wear sari but can also speak English, that I'm talking of traditional skill sets but with my thoughts on an iPad. Jinnan once said, learning is an integrated event, it is not a separate process. 6,400 communities, 1,618 languages, 27 major festivals, 8 religions, 29 states, 1 country. India, trying to create a contemporary identity for itself in the 21st century, is stumbling between tradition and modernity, east and west, branded and handmade, global and rural, technology and craft. Powerful electronic media beaming 24-7 images mean that the young are overly influenced by one-sided signals and role models. The shadow of years of colonialism also mean that we are in some way have, uh, have knee-jerk reactions. This is particularly so in matters of culture, lifestyle, and aesthetic. Our educational syllabus and structures are also tilted heavily in one direction. A frequently aired t ad on t television shows an Adivasi woman exuberantly dancing in her tribal sari and cooking a meal in her village home. The camera then pans to her in a drab unisex uniform, driving a van. The voiceover has her saying that now that she wears pant shirt and has a company job, people give her much more respect. And her own self-image has changed. For me, this ad is a paradigm of contemporary Indian attitudes and the growing separation between urban and rural India in values, attitudes, and aspirations, and the increasing marginalization of traditional skill sets and knowledge. In our lemming rush to Western modernity and technological skills, both traditional communities and the urban middle class are busy throwing out the baby with the bathwater. How can we change this? How can our educational system include and impart these subtle but important messages? We need to find innovative ways to inspire and educate Gen Next and ignite new cultural and aesthetic responses in the India of the future. A wonderful painting by the famous French painter Paul Gauguin is entitled, Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? It's a question that rings in my head. I work in the Indian craft sector Craftspeople form the second largest employment sector in India, second only to agriculture. One in every 200 Indians is an artisan. It's the 21st century and India has nuclear capability and the world's fastest growing IT industry. But we also do have crafts and craftspeople. Craft represents a sector of over 20 million practitioners with a geographic spread that embraces all of India and covers a huge gamut of wildly differ differing 
work structures and cultures, with craftspeople working in a huge range of techniques and technologies using materials that range from clay to precious metals. Craft is one of the largest contributors to the economy in export revenues as well as domestic sales. All over India, people handcraft everything from a terracotta tumbler to a temple, a wicker basket to diamond jewelry. Crafts are part of our aesthetic and culture, just as they are also part of our economy, in our marketplace as well as our cultural memory. This is one of India's unique strengths as it searches for its own identity in a world that is increasingly uniform and technological. One of the paradoxes, therefore, in a nation full of paradoxes, is India's attitude to its crafts and craftspeople. For most foreigners, they are one of our glories, making India uniquely distinctive and different. Other countries, especially the West, lament the loss of such traditions as they review their own two-century cycle of industrialization and mass production, accompanied by de-skilling and mass unemployment. The Chinese have long had their beady eyes on our craft skills and have been importing Indian craftspeople from Kolapuri chapel makers to Kanjivaram sari weavers and stone carvers for over two decades to teach their own craftspeople their skills. Always a savvy march ahead of other Asian countries, the Chinese realize that in any globalized consumer economy, the country that holds the cards is one that has both an industrialized and a handicraft base. They know that consumers, as they become more sophisticated and demanding, want exclusive, one-of-a-kind products rather than run-of-the-mill, high-street brands, and these can only be made by hand. Increasingly, other Asian countries too, Thailand, Indonesia, Cambodia, Malaysia, Nepal, the Philippines, have realized that indigenous crafts can give them an international edge. That crafts and craftspeople using natural materials handcrafted in uniquely local traditions have an appeal both as merchandise and as a part of the new, new ecotourism boom. Only India views it's 20 million plus craftspeople is a liability rather than an asset. A senior bureaucrat scarily referred to it as a sunset industry. And instead of investing in the sector, the general wisdom is to prop it up with subsidies until it disappears altogether. And slowly but surely, it is disappearing. Few craftspeople want their children to be craftspeople. Official figures show we have lost over 15% of our craftspeople in the last decade. Nevertheless, and here's another paradox, craft sales, both domestically and export, are increasing at 15 to 20% a year, hardly a setting sun. The liberalization and globalization of the last three decades have brought widespread economic benefits, but also made consumers look westward once more for their style icons and status symbols. Sadly, international brands and trends now dictate how India's new middle class dress and live. While food and music are seen as an integral part of the culture and lifestyle of a community, craft is now relegated to an occasional souvenir or knick-knack. The halls and hotels in which we have spent the last two days have not a trace of the architectural and decorative arts that convey a sense of place and meaning. This message has even trickled down into rural India. Doubly curious, since while economists and activists agonize over unemployment, carbon footprints, and the depletion of natural energy resources, craft is such an obvious alternative. With a simple eco-friendly needle, palm leaf, spindle, or loom, and the inherent skill of their hands, Craftspeople, especially women, can support their families and enrich the national economy and exports. But because these craftspeople are village-bound, unorganized, and illiterate, their voices and needs are never heard, nor is their potential realized. The raw material they depend on, yarn, bamboo cane, lark, 
leather are being exported abroad or diverted to the industrial sector. Financial credit, social security schemes and investment ignore them. So design, science and craft, how can we take them out of these boxes and make them work together? I've just been sent a copy of a book by Divya Patel, part of a proposed exhibition on Indian design at the V&A in London. It puts contemporary Indian design, fashion, interiors, graphic communication into a neat, colorful box, all ordered and arranged in sequence. Of course, Indian craft, Indian design, like Indian life, isn't like that. India is a huge, messy, chaotic, multi-layered country with everything going on at tangent. No sooner do you come to one conclusion than you discover something that completely contradicts it. For example, just as you conclude that traditional Indian design is all about color and ornamentation and excess, you encounter somewhere like Kerala and the austere monotones of its off-white textiles edged with gold and the flowing simple lines of its ulis. You decide that Indian motives are all floral, jals, and booties, and you are reminded of the black, white, and red dramatic stripes of Naga shawls, or the checkered patterns of irical weaves. Men weave and women embroider. In Kashmir, it's the men who embroider, and in Assam, it's the women who weave, and so on and on. Another almost universally accepted truism in India is that design is the diametric opposite of, dis of science, a rather frivolous fringe activity fit only for girls looking for husbands. Parents urging their sons to go into engineering or medicine or architecture shudder at the thought of fashion or that the, he may opt to be that effete object, a designer. It escapes the average layman that every surgical instrument and bridgehead needs to be designed in order to fulfill its function, and that engineering and design are practically twin brothers. For the man in the street, design means surface ornamentation, making things look pretty. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I think it was Steve Jobs who said, design is not just what it looks like and feels like, design is how it works. Ornamentation is not design. Design is matching a need to a function. Design is not like an aerosol spray, instantly making things smell lovely. Then you come to craft. Words like craft and heritage carry a lot of baggage with them. In the Indian context, they're especially emotive. To trendy yuppies in metropolitan cities, they carry connotations of something that is boring, passe, and irrelevant. To others, the word evokes images of a 5,000 year civilization with rich multiple cultures and traditions of which each one of us claims ownership and wants never to change. Some want the heritage clock to stop short at pre-Mughal India. A few recognize that craft never was and never should be static. Both schools of thought ignore the fact that craft has always been a market-led activity that evolves and adapts itself along with the lifestyles, needs, and demands of the consumers. We may think that all kachi embroidery is the same mirror work, but actually every one of the half dozen tribal communities has its own distinctive motive and stitch directory. A rabari embroiderer can date a piece within a decade by the colors, motives, and placements and the raw materials available at the time. National identity need not be traditional. Building a building using marble and inlay does not mean it has to look like the Taj Mahal. Wearing brocade and embroidery doesn't mean your clothes look, should look out of Mughal Azam. The dilemma today is not that craftspeople do not want to respond to new mores, but that they're distanced from their end user in ways they were never before, and are therefore manipulated by quick money, making of quick buck entrepreneurs and exporters. And they find it difficult to understand and keep pace 
with change. Urban designers are similarly distanced from the craft tradition, a divide that both technology and an urban designer can bridge if they are sensitive and ready to listen as well as speak. Similarly, the choice is not an either or of technology or handcraft. Each has its place and purpose, and often a linking of both would create an exciting and necessary dynamic. Words, as we discussed yesterday, are important. I personally hate words like revival, preservation, heritage, traditional, when applied to the work I do in craft. Craft is a living, changing, constantly evolving practice which responds to society in the world. Its roots, to use an analogy of Guruji's from yesterday, are deep, but the flowers and fruit it brings forth are fresh and perennially relevant. These days, a huge debate is on, on power loom versus hand loom, with many movers and shakers, whether bureaucrats, economists, or politicians, affirming that hand loom is irrelevant and dead. A fact, by the way, not validated by any market survey. In actual fact, as I said earlier, sales of the hand loom handicraft sector increased by 18 to 20 percent every year. It's a niche market, but a growing one internationally as well as nationally. So rather than throw away hand looms and with them the countless amazing textiles and motives that the power loom can never replicate, let's apply technology and all those brilliant young minds to working on the structures and processes of the hand loom and see in what ways it can be adapted and what should never be changed. Make it less labor intensive while retaining its inherent skills. Strengths. A weaver in Kanjivaram has just won an award for adapting his loom so he can operate it single-handedly rather than requiring an additional trained apprentice. I can think of dozens of other crafts processes from dhokra metal crafting to lark bangle making where little science would ease the life of these fantastic creative artists and give them the space to innovate and explore. This goes from processing of raw material to developing appropriate packaging for the finished product. And obviously, this includes the process itself. A craftsperson doesn't have to sit on the floor whittling with a piece of broken stone in order to qualify as a craftsperson. But if that sitting on the floor is a part of something that makes the work go faster, let him be there. We are fortunate in India to have both living traditional craftspeople with extraordinary hand skills, as well as scientists and technocrats capable of sending satellites into space. Both sectors have some of the liveliest minds and talents. Alas, the two seldom meet. Design, craft, and fashion are customarily seen as soft disciplines. Science and technology is hard. In fact, like a man and a woman, they actually both have essential elements of each other. Again, like a man and a woman, a partnership between the two results in a powerful creative energy. We need to unbox the assets, attributes, and professional skills of each, sharing knowledge and awareness and skill sets, creating a unique synergy and potential, and enriching our amazing country in the process. Knowledge is an experience not a formula. In addition, crafts can be used as a means of interpreting many social issues and ways of living. Crafts in India are so universally pre prevalent that it has been used over the years as a metaphor for numerous philosophic, metaphysical, and social concepts. Many words, forms of measurement, colors, and materials have a craft origin. The tana and bana of life is something with which we are all familiar. Caste, gender, religion, and social practice all play significant and varying roles. Craft, both in theory and practice, can be a powerful tool of emotional, economic, and intellectual empowerment for children at all levels, locations, and sectors of school and society. One huge virtue of craft is that it negates the need 
for everything to be absolutely identical. Industrial mass production is killing individual creativity. Must, so we must market the strength of craft, uh, which is that each piece can be different. Uniqueness of each craft object should be a selling point rather than a negative. The noted master craftsperson, Ganapati Sthapati, warned us apropos of Western versus Indian traditional culture. If we don't tell them, they will tell us. We could do well to turn this observation on its head and reflect that if we do not listen to craftspeople, a time may come when they will not be around to listen to us. So, why should we include the study of craft and education? not out of a simple nostalgia for the past. We need to think of craftspeople as rich knowledge, a huge and important resource of traditional knowledge and indigenous technologies. It's a means to shape the social, cultural, physical, and mental development of the individual. It's a means to seek equality of opportunity for all. It upholds and teaches democracy in a way that promotes the empowerment of individuals and communities. It promotes a productive economy. It promotes sustainable development. It teaches us to value our identity, our relationships, ourselves, and the wider groups to which we belong. It promotes the diversity of our country. Craft is one of the few professions that is a direct result of the natural environment in which it is practiced. The existence of the surrounding natural materials, stone, wood, metal, clay, cotton, cane and bamboo, silk, lark, is the impetus of most traditional crafts. This harmonious balance between man and nature, economic growth and <coughs> environmental balance, not requiring huge inputs of artificial energy, infrastructure, or investment is what makes craft viable and valuable today. In a world increasingly dependent on resources that come from outside, craft has many lessons for us. However, it should be taught with the warning that most of these natural raw material sources are being rapidly depleted. Forests are being cut down and not replanted. Water is being polluted. Many grasses and reeds are no longer available. For instance, Andhra Pradesh's famed cotton fields are being turned to cotton to tobacco cultivation. Some years ago, my organization, Dastkar, held an exhibition of embroidered and applique wall hangings at the IHC farm court. These were not cushions and bedspreads, but large, one-of-a-kind original pieces, renderings from the craftswomen's creative imagination with abstract or pictorial themes. The makers from Kutch, Karnataka, Bihar, and Banaskanta were master craftswomen of many years standing. Next door, in the visual arts gallery, a young artist just out of art college was having her first solo exhibition. When visitors came to the Daska exhibition, everyone loved the pieces, but completely freaked out at the prices, ranging from eight to 15,000 rupees. Hissing, shocked exclamations such as, has Daskar gone mad? 10,000 for a mirror work, wall hanging, etc. They then went into the other gallery. There they viewed, perfectly calmly and with no surprise at all, oil paintings of much the same size and no extraordinary artistic quality, priced at rupees 45,000 and above. We did sell our wall hangings, but the viewers' reactions to the two forms of art told their own story. To uh, add a further irony, had the same embroidered pieces been old or even antique to look old, they could have sold for several times the price. Just a couple of months later, I took the same craftspeople to Sweden, where their work was being exhibited at the Boros Museum as part of a prestigious international art show. Their roles were reversed. Because the women were rural craftswomen, without professional art training, dressed in picturesque traditional costumes, their work got much more press coverage and critical notice 
than the other artists from Scandinavia, India, and Europe. They became minor celebrities, wined and dined everywhere, and incidentally developed a great passion for beer. Both scenarios seem a bit skewed. Surely art should be judged on artistic merit rather than its social origins. In ancient India, craft and art were one, both anonymous, both an integral part of home, worship, and everyday life, not segregated into gallery displays or marketplace commerce. Today, India, like the rest of the world, has an invisible caste system, giving real artists a higher value and status than craftspeople making traditional pieces in traditional media, however unusual and beautiful. In contemporary India, the age-old debate of craft versus art has a special poignancy since it carries with it so much of the baggage of caste and social prejudice. Artists like Sulekha, Minalini Mukherjee, Neeta Thakur, or Monica Kuria, who work in textile, have no problem breaking the barrier of medium, and studio ceramics command huge prices. Sometimes, these are pieces that traditional Indian potters would look askance at, feeling their own technical ability far superior. They wonder why their work is relegated to the pavement or the lihat. So where are we heading today? Indian art prices are breaking the stratosphere, but craftspeople are not part of that party. Will there always be two separate streams of contemporary Indian art, one canvases and installations made by studio painters, and one by so-called folk artists and craftspeople? one sold in galleries, the other in bazaars and mailers? Will the first always be priced and valued higher than the other? Or can the occasional crossover that happens, for example, the extraordinary exhibitions of innovative artworks done by Kachi craftspeople, curated by Carol Douglas and shown in Australia, Bhuj and Ahmedabad, or the path-breaking crafted art pieces made by Daska craftspeople for the Italian designer Tashito become a trend that dissolves these absurd barriers. For us, that week in Sweden was full of all kinds of unexpected encounters, exchanges, and interactions. East met West, embroiderers met artists, craftswomen met craftsmen, folk painters from the North met folk painters from the South, artists met academics and critics. These encounters rewarding in themselves have made me reflect a lot on the underlining issues and meanings of culture and art and ways that we could explore them in the future. One of the themes is the visible and invisible differences, dynamics and perception of art and craft. How did the single vision and signature of the Western cultural tradition march with the anonymity and continuity of Indian folk art? Did collective art, rather than a single vision, diminish the value of a piece of art? Is a votive painting done in the style of one's ancestors less or more meaningful than a secular piece painted by an art school nurtured contemporary artist? Is it we, the urban buyers and viewers, who force folk artists to freeze tradition and go on replicating their forefathers? Could it be our limitation rather than theirs? We are the ones who want them to continue to produce recognizable, familiar images. Tourists want miniatures of Mughal emperors, not our current rather lumpy and unlovely leaders. One of Daska's challenges is to reinvent traditional craft and give it a new look and appeal without destroying its own unique identity. India's greatest advantage is that we have our feet in both East and West and have not lost our cultural traditions and arts in the process of acquiring new aptitudes like English or information technology. This awareness needs to be passed to the next generation. You are that next generation and it is you who will decide whether crafts and craftspeople survive. As more and more people move to the cities, and education is increasingly geared to developing professional expertise with an international corporate potential. 
we need to ensure that schools and colleges inculcate an awareness of India's own skill sets. This needs to be done in a manner that is creative and fun, not as a bit of irrelevant history. It should relate to everyday life and the other professional expertise students are acquiring. When Jinnan and I were on the National Curriculum Review some years ago, I was chairperson of the craft subcommittee trying to get craft into mainstream education. I fought very hard that it should not be labeled as heritage craft because I felt that sent out this message that craft is of the past, not of today. Catching people young is important if you want to change mindsets and capture their imaginations. Contemporary Indians get terribly excited when an Indian enters space, wins a beauty contest, or gets a silver medal at the Olympics. Sonia Mirza entering the tennis best hundred had us agog. But few appreciate India's unique distinction of having literally millions of existing craftspeople practicing skills that exist nowhere else in the world. Sadly, the mushrooming malls that have become the aspirational symbol of emerging New India do not include crafts as a rule. As Thomas Randolph, a poet I love, said in the 17th century, it is time that we grew wise when all the world grows mad. At one of our Daskar bazaars, an 80-year-old Manipuri woman wearing a worn handloom wrapping was asked whether she wasn't cold. Why did she not buy any one of the warm synthetic mill woolies available on the market. Her reply reminds us of so many intangible things we disregard. I spun this out of my own hands. My mother and sisters have woven it. My mother learnt it from her mother, and her mother from her mother, and her mother from her mother before her. The warmth of so many fingers has gone into this. The generations of the women of my family enfold me. How can I be cold? How can a machine make anything warmer? As the textile scholar Lothika Vardarajan once said, to sacrifice craft traditions at the altar of modernity is tantamount to adding yet another dimension to the poverty of the mind. The American writer Tennessee Williams said, make journeys, attempt them. It's the only way. What India needs now is not only a physical journey, but a voyage of inner and external discovery, a reaching out to new horizons of the mind and spirit. We should attempt many more such bridgings of art and of ourselves. If we lose craft and the millions of families who have carried these magic, unique traditions through the centuries, we lose not only them, but a part of India and ourselves. Thank you.